Welcome to the Prophecy Chronicles with your host, Paul Richard Price. Hello and good evening uh, everyone here on uh, UPRN 105.5 in New Orleans, as well as all of you who are listening on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is Paul Richard Price here with another great episode of the Prophecy Chronicles. My guest tonight is the field coordinator for Montana of the John Birch Society, and his name is Robert Brown. And Robert, I'd like to thank you so very much for being a guest on my show, and how and how are you? Oh, absolutely, I'm doing very well, thank you. And I'm so and I'm so happy about that. Now, explain to my listeners, uh, for those of them who may have heard some of the. Uh, erroneous rumors about the John Birch uh, Society. What is and what is the history of the John Birch Society? You know, that's a great place to start. Years ago, I believed many of the rumors myself, so I can understand where some people may be coming from there. The John Birch Society was first started on December 9th of 1958, so they've been around just over 50 years. And it one of the first things I had to learn was that it was not started by John Birch. <laughs> John Birch was actually a, uh, a war hero during World War II, who at the conclusion of World War II, he was over in China at the time, and uh, there was a real, I guess, a real pivotal time in the political history of China going on at the time. There were two major forces, a man by the name of Mao Zedong, who we all know today to be the one who implemented communism in China. But at the time, the U.S. press was promoting him as not a communist, but an agrarian reformer. Then the other the other camp was a, a man by the name of uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who was actually a Christian, and he was a constitutionalist, really. He was someone who had drawn up a constitution modeled after our own U.S. constitution and was seeking to create a constitutional republic in China. And making a long story short here, uh, John Birch was working with the U.S. Army in helping them behind enemy lines there as, as China and the United States were fighting against Japan. Uh, at the end of the war, ten days after the war, John Birch was sent on a, a mission to go find out what a particular group of people were, if they were friend or foe, and it turned out to be Mao Zedong's people, and they answered this question by murdering him on the spot. So John Birch, many historians may look to as probably the first martyr of the Cold War with communism. The uh, the real surprise behind all that is that John Birch, one of our own troops over there in China, uh, with his death, it wasn't reported throughout the media in the United States, and even his own parents weren't told how he died. They were told that he was killed in a training exercise, and his death was covered up by the government and by the media. And really, that problem that our own government, number one, covered for Mao Zedong and was telling our own people that he was not a communist, but that he was an agrarian reformer and he's our ally, and then they were also really propagandizing against Chiang Kai-shek, who's trying to create a constitutional republic. We're one of the main reasons why China is communist today, both the uh, complicity of the media as well as some within the U.S. government who were covering for and helping Mao Zedong. And so... The John Birch Society was started in 1958 to help counteract those within our own country that are trying to help promote communism. The uh, same story could be told of virtually any country that has become communist, uh, Cuba, for example, where our own government was referring to him as the George Washington of Cuba and the freedom fighter and that kind of thing. We later find out, sure enough, he was communist, and we helped him get into power. So the whole purpose of the John Birch Society has been to expose those who are working to diminish liberty throughout the world, and especially within our own country. Uh, Communism being one of the many targets of that. I guess that's kind of a a short story version of what the John Birch Society was founded for, simply to expose those that are enemies to liberty and to teach the principles of liberty so people can recognize the difference between the two. Well, we're seeing right now a change in our government right now, being that a lot of people 
I do believe, with the best of intentions, voted for a man who is a strong national or has strong leanings towards national socialism. Now, can you explain to us why this is bad? Why socialism is bad? <laughs> How much time do we have? Wow. <laughs> well, there's really two different uh, two different viewpoints. Like you're saying, some who sincerely believe in socialism, although to my satisfaction, I've never seen the socialist experiment work. Uh, it's a form of both economics as well as just a form of liberty versus control over the people that never is a long-standing form of government. It ends up bankrupting itself. And so, uh, just on the one hand, socialism is, is not a stable form. But another problem with it is that uh, it is based on Marxism. Uh, Marxism, uh, you, you can really see the, uh, the whole basis of Marxism by reading the Communist Manifesto, which virtually everything within the Communist Manifesto is completely counter to what our nation stands for, the principles of liberty. And there are many within our, our nation historically that feel like communism is not a legitimate political party or political viewpoint. It is a treasonous viewpoint, because it does undermine every liberty that we have guaranteed within the Constitution. It goes directly contrary to religious freedom. It goes contrary to the right to bear arms, the right to free speech, any any of the rights we have guaranteed within the Constitution. And really the socialist or communist model, well, we have a history of in our nation as well. It was first tried in, in Jamestown, and it was also tried at uh, the Plymouth Colony. They both tried a communistic form of government, which nearly caused them to starve to death which is really the, the real story behind Thanksgiving. The main reason they were starving was they were trying to live under a communist form of government. And once uh, William Bradford, with the Plymouth Colony, turned private property rights over to the people and said, sink or swim, you either produce or you starve, suddenly they became very pro productive and prosperous. So uh, one of many examples we can give on the fault within the communist, socialist, Marxist um, mentality. We could go. We could go into that at great length, but uh, I think that's a good nutshell version of the, some of the dangers of socialism and other isms. Okay, but and we're talking about socialism or communism and how it basically may have started uh, back in Europe, even before Karl Marx had anything to do with it. We're talking about the Bavarian Illuminati and its founder, Adam Weishaupt, mm -hmm. who was a former Jesuit priest who turned against the Catholic uh, Church and went and formed an anti-God, pro-humanistic uh, society of people that he believed could rule the world. And could you tell us something about that from your own knowledge? In regards to the Bavarian Illuminati... You know, one of the most interesting things about that is that for quite a while they were operating very secretively um, in several different countries in Europe, in Western Europe primarily. But uh, the most interesting thing to me is that how it first came to light was there was a courier sending messages back and forth as he was trying to establish uh, Illuminati cells in different countries. He was sending the instructions on, here are the plans, here's how to do it. And this courier was struck by lightning and killed and had all the plans on his body, everything that uh, they were trying to create and execute. And so that is where it first really came to light, what many people look at as probably an act of God, striking this, this man with lightning so that the, the truth would come out. There was a book that was published back late 1700s called Proofs of a Conspiracy, which was basically a compilation of those plans being published to the world, but they can expose it. This is something that people like George Washington read about, knew about, and saw elements of it trying to get within our own country, even back then in the late 1700s. He spoke out against it. So this is, this is nothing new. Um, the socialism, communism, Marxism side is, you know, maybe came on a little bit later in the, in the plan, 
but the plans of overthrowing liberty and creating a really globalism is a plan that uh, has been tried all throughout the ages of the world, and White House is just the more recent modern version of it. But uh, you can look through the history of the world at many different examples of different countries or individuals trying to take over the world, create one government that rules the entire world. It's been tried since the dawn of man, really. Okay, let me bring this up. I've got to play the dev- the devil's advocate right now. Okay. Why is it so bad to have a globalized world governmental system? Why? Tell me. That's a great question. Let me back it up a little bit by, first of all, looking at some of their immediate plans, like, well, the European Union forming over there, and now efforts to create a North American Union on this continent. The union of smaller nations or states into a larger one inherently itself isn't a bad thing. Um, that when people talk about North American Union, sometimes I see people respond, well, what's wrong with that? And the problem isn't the forming of smaller nations into a larger body. That's really what happened back in 1776, 1787, when we formed this nation. Thirteen colonies, which were virtually separate nations, pulling together for a common interest, common defense, and so on. And if the plans were to preserve liberty in that kind of a manner, it wouldn't necessarily be such a bad thing if they were under the same principles of freedom guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. The problem comes where it's not liberty that we're trying to create here. It is slavery. It is the socialist Marxist viewpoint, which destroys all rights, all liberties. The government controls and dictates everything. It's a totalitarian state. And at that point, you're only hope is to pray for a benevolent dictator, one that's kind to you, because that's the only <laughs> the only hope you have of having any kind of peaceful life. It really destroys everything this nation was founded on. The, the founding fathers left a smaller version of that type of state under King George, where it was dictatorial, it was a totalitarian state. They had some freedoms with the Magna Carta and other things. But they left England, broke away from it with the Declaration of Independence because of the many abuses to their freedoms that they had. What we're talking about here is going right back to King George and worse. And that's really what the problem is. It's the form of government that is being proposed and enacted for this globalist control. Okay, and who are the modern-day conspirators of this great conspiracy that you and the John Birch society are promoting right now what are who are the uh, key players the secret government so to speak okay well, the, the actual key players many of them are unknown uh, we can point out a few uh, one of one of those I would say is probably foremost is a man by the name of David Rockefeller and his many different organizations that he has started or co-chaired or whatever such as the Trilateral Commission or the Council on Foreign Relations, many different organizations like that that all are working towards unifying nations under his control, under the international control of many of the banking systems, both the uh, Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and so on, who really are the ones that control both the European banking system as well as the Federal Reserve banking system in our nation, have a tremendous amount of power through that system, that influences the uh, governments of many nations. One of their uh, grandfathers, a man by the name of Meher Amschel Rothschild, uh, once declared, give me the control of the issuance of a nation's currency, and I care not who makes its laws. What he means by that is if he's the one that's issuing the money, he has the power of the purse to really control the laws, the governing bodies of that nation, regardless of who's in power. And that's where we are today. We have groups like the Federal Reserve and and others funding organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations. And for those who are not familiar with what the Council on Foreign Relations is, it's an organization started by um, really the right-hand man to uh, President Woodrow Wilson way back in the early 1900s, a man by the name of uh, Edward Mendel House, who, in his own publication, he declared he was working for, quote, 
communism as envisioned by Karl Marx. And really, Mendel House is one who established things like the Federal Reserve, the um, graduated income tax, and the IRS system that we have today. And he was trying for an organization called the League of Nations, which would be really a world-governing body. When that didn't come to pass, he saw that the mindset of the United States was nowhere near going towards a League of Nations type governing body. He then established in about 1919, 1920, a group called the Council on Foreign Relations to prepare the minds of the American people to be more amenable to world government, to slowly, incrementally move us that direction, and to control as much as possible people within the governing body, especially Washington, D.C. They've been very successful in that where today, um, really for the last many presidencies, you have somewhere around 250 or so members of the Council on Foreign Relations in key cabinet positions of every presidency for several decades now, really being the main controlling body of whatever happens in the White House, regardless of who the president is. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican or Democrat president, when you have the same group behind it. I, I once saw an article published that uh, put it very simply, and it went back through different uh, presidential races that uh, this last year, Barack Obama, CFR affiliate, defeated um, John McCain, also a CFR member. And the previous election, so-and-so defeated so-and-so, both members of the CFR, previous election to that, CFR member defeated this CFR member, and it, it goes that, back that way for a few decades that uh, virtually everyone in the presidential position, either candidate from either party, has strong ties to this globalist organization, which is really the main reason why you change parties in the White House and things don't seem to change much. We still have wide open borders. We still march steadily towards integrating with other nations in a more globalist setup. Well, one thing I want to bring up right now is the mere fact that we're looking at several uh, in, in, incarnations of national socialism uh, throughout history. The, one of the more recent ones was Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And I brought this up in the previous show I did before I got fired from my other web, um, the other um, network that I was on for bringing this up, but I do believe it needs to be brought up. You look at what Barack Obama is currently doing, with like the uh, youth, the youth corps, uh, mandatory service to the uh, country and all, it all steams back. Go back in history, people, and learn from what history is teaching you. What happened in Nazi Germany prior to World War II, when Adolf Hitler took over? He had the children singing his praises as if he was the new messiah. What is happening now, people? The same thing happening with Barack Obama. Now, I'm going to clarify this to all of you. I'm not saying he's a Nazi, but I'm saying they're following the same pattern and the same playbook that Nazi Germany used with the rise in power of Adolf Hitler. Now, I'm not against him uh, being a black president. I have nothing against him in that manner. But being that he is an admitted socialist and globalist, is what he is doing to the benefit of the United States or to the, uh, to the uh, benefit of, my friends, the globalist agenda? And maybe you can uh, espouse, uh, espouse some uh, information on that, Robert, if you would, please. In regards to the globalist agenda? Well, I mean to Barack Obama and the globalist okay. agenda. Well, you know, really, I, I don't consider Barack Obama to be one of the main conspirators, for one thing. That, uh, as you and I have discussed before, he's really more of a, a puppet executing the plans of those who are working toward globalism. But uh, many of the different things you, you're seeing, one of the things that uh, the John Birch Society has produced recently, it's really the most popular of any educational tool we've ever made. It's a DVD called Overview of America, which 
honestly, you can go on to google.com, go to the uh, video section, look up Overview of America. It's a 29-minute video you can watch right there online. But some of the things it does in there is it, first of all, defines different forms of government from, a, from communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, and so on. And that all of these are 100% government. And it puts all of those over on one end of the scale. And on the other end of the scale, say on the left side is anything that's 100% government. On the right side is zero government uh, tyranny. So really you have anything that uh, falls under the Marxism, Marxism umbrella as far left. Where today's modern um, press tries to say fascism is the far right and socialism, communism is the far left. Well, no, those are both totalitarian forms of government. Both are 100% government. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, the way we view things, and this and this displayed in this video, is that 0% government on the far right, which is anarchy. And what we strive for isn't a far right or far left. We strive for a very moderate view in that, in that scale. Uh, really, we're constitutional moderates. We want a proper balance between too much and too little government. We have just the right amount that protects the freedom of the people without being invasive on the people's rights and freedoms as well. And so what we're seeing, whether there's been a Democrat or Republican in, in the White House, a steady move further and further towards the left with a larger and larger government um, encroaching further and further upon our freedoms. And Barack Obama is really just the latest chapter in that, albeit a uh, much bigger step forward down that uh, path toward total, total government control. The biggest difference I see between him and, say, John McCain having won the presidency is the pace at which he's marching us towards that totalitarian level of government, the unlimited form that uh, is illustrated in this, this video. But oftentimes I do public showings of this DVD, Overview of America, and the one thing I love to watch towards maybe the second half of the video, he goes through and defines the different economic systems where under Nazism, for example, they, that form of government controls all the different businesses of the country and ends up owning some of them. Fascism is the same way. Um, and he gives the example in the video of the government ownership of Volkswagen. Now, every time I, I'm watching the audience, as they see that illustrated, they all start thinking, well, that's like General Motors with our government takeover of that c company. It parallels very much the Nazism economic model there. And so, oh, Robert, could I uh, could I interrupt just one, just real briefly? Go ahead. Um, my uh, listeners in the chat room are having a hard time hearing you. Could you speak up just a little bit louder, please? Thank you. Yes, certainly. I hope this is better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so really, the the main thing we're seeing is that, well, as we dis display this DVD people began to recognize elements of fascism, of Nazism, of socialism, and even elements of communism in our nation today, where, as we go through on this DVD, he defines what each of those are, what their economic models are like, and we're seeing government takeover of many different corporations. Our own President Obama uh, firing CEO or president of various companies, telling them how much their wages can be. Uh, this is all totalitarian forms of government we're seeing here. Whether you want to call it Nazism, fascism, socialism, it has elements of each of those in it. It's really kind of a combination of all of the above. And so, uh, the, the press today, if you start calling President Obama a social, they'll mock you, they'll laugh at you, but they'll never try to prove you wrong because they can't. If you actually go down to the nitty-gritty of what he's doing and what model of government it models, it is socialism. It is based on Marxism. It's based on a totalitarian, unlimited form of government. So, where you got a little bit of heat for calling it, uh, comparing it to what Nazi Germany did, well, I'd compare it to really any totalitarian regime that's been in the history of the world, Nazism being one example. But there are elements of fascism and socialism in there as well. And what did uh, Benito Mussolini uh, say about uh, socialism? Or was it social? Oh, no, fascism. That it's Are corporate social. That it's uh, corporate socialism. Yeah. The corporations con controlling 
every or controlling everything and or every everything uh, dealing with the government. And this and is something. Oh, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, go ahead. The point you're making there is that is great is that uh, fascism, even under Mussolini's own admission, is a form of socialism. And going back to Nazism, you have to understand what Nazism stands for. It's National Socialist. That's what Nazi stands for, is the National Socialist Party. It's just another version of socialism. It's not a different kind of government. These are all based on Karl Marx. And not only Karl Mar Marx, but the uh, original goals of uh, the Illuminati were espoused in the works of um, Cecil Rhodes and the Rhodes uh, Foundation, which all of the Rhodes Scholarship, and a lot of uh, one particular recent past president was a Rhodes Scholar, William Jeff Jefferson Clinton. Yes. And he did espouse the globalist agenda while he was he was president of the United States. And could you go into that into more detail with my listeners as to who Cecil Rhodes, Rhodes was, why is it that even after his death, so many years later, he still has a very strong influence on our government. I, I think you really just covered that, at least in a, a brief sense, in that the whole purpose that he set up the Rhodes, Rhodes Scholarship system was to fund some of the sharper uh, students as they're going through their academic career, giving them the Rhodes Scholarship was really to help find those that they could train to be um, some of the leaders in the in the movement, whether they're in, indoctrinated and in believing in the altruistic claims of of socialism, or whether they're actually insiders. But uh, either way, it, it was a way of training up the next generation of those that will lead us towards their agenda. One thing I want to point out, though, is that communism is not truly the root of the problem. Uh, communism is not the true enemy behind everything. And this is best illustrated by a story by a lady by the name of Bella Dodd, who back in, uh, oh, this is probably mid 1900s lady who had a very prominent position in the Communist Party USA. And she always got her orders directly from Moscow. As to whatever she needed to do, she'd always speak to them, counsel with them, they'd give her directions, and she'd execute their plans. But there came a time where her communication lines were disrupted between her and Moscow at a crucial time where she was needing to get some information from them. Later, when they reconnected, she asked them, what should I do if ever again our communications are lying and I have crucial decisions that need to be made? They told her a particular place to go in New York where she'd given instructions and, and move forward. She, at later times, she did go to that location told them who she was, they invited her in, and she was shocked to find out that those who were giving their, her the instructions were those that were looked at as the major capitalist leaders of the United States. We're talking people like the, the Rockefellers, the J.P. Morgan type, and so on. But these were the people she thought were the enemies, the real capitalist leaders. She thought of as the enemy. And she was even more shocked to see that whatever they said... Moscow would sign off on as well. And she began to see over process of time that Moscow was getting their orders from these capitalists in the United States. And she quit the Communist Party at this point with a statement declaring that I believe that the communist conspiracy is really part of a much bigger conspiracy. And that's, that's really the point I want to make is that even communism is just being used as a tool the, uh, the insiders, those who are working towards towards this globalist ideal, they, they don't believe in the virtues of communism or socialism. They, they're using it as a tool. They, they don't believe in anything but power. So it's not, it's not a war of ideas. It's not a war of principles that they believe one thing, we believe another, and we need to just convert them over to our way of thinking. They understand that what they're doing is harmful to our nation. One of the best examples of that comes from David Rockefeller himself. 
This is one of my favorite quotes from him. This is from his book, Memoirs, from 2002, where he says of he and his family, let's see, some even believe that we are a part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others, he uses the word conspiring, with others around the world to build a more integrated, global, political, and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty, and I'm proud of it. That's kind of recap. He, he's saying he's proud of working against the best interests of the United States. He's proud of conspiring with others around the world. He's proud of creating a one-world form of government. He knows very clearly that what he's doing is against the best interests of the United States. This isn't people that believe in communism and socialism as the, the model for a utopian society. These are people that are executing these plans against the best interests of our nation. And, so, and, and that's one of the key points that the John Birch Society president makes over and over again, jo John McManus, that we're fighting against men who have evil intent. We're not fighting against a differing point of view. Well, the one thing I wanted to uh, bring up to my listeners in the audience is the mere fact that these men are globalist and they are capitalist. They make their money <clears throat> off of the exchange of uh, products, goods, and um, services worldwide. And it would not be to their best interest to erode the power structure of the United States. Now, the question I have is, if it goes contrary to what their own belief structure is, why do it? <laughs> I, I remember wondering that same thing as I first started learning about this years ago. That these, these people who have become fabulously wealthy through the free market capital system in our nation working to destroy that very system. And yet they're in a position where they're creating far more wealth, power, and control by trying to create this globalist form of government. It, it's not that, it's like I said before, they don't believe in capitalism. They believe in a totalitarian total control in which they're the ones that have total control. That's, that's all they believe in, is power and greed. And so, though it, it created the, uh, the foundation of wealth that they're building it upon, they're perfectly willing to destroy that form of government and that free market system for what would be, be more beneficial to them, when they have more power and there's less that can oppose them. And really, the biggest obstacle to their plans is the U.S. Constitution and that deep, deeply rooted love of liberty uh, throughout the citizens of the United States. We really are their biggest obstacle toward globalism. Well, let me uh, bring this up before we go on our first break. I wanted you to bring this up uh, right now for my listeners who may have heard of the uh, prison in Hardin, Montana. Oh, yes. And may have heard it from the Alex Jones uh, radio show. Tell my listeners what you told me about what my the, friend they've done. The main, the that. main, the main exciting part of that is that there has been so much attention drawn to what's going on in Hardin, Montana, which is really a, a foreignly, a foreign-owned company called American Police Force. Um, coming in, and really, there's a lot of things behind it that are very fishy. Uh, the, the main person in charge of it, with a long train of felonies and over a million dollars in judgments against him that he's unpaid still, and yet, uh, for some reason, a tremendous amount of funding behind it. And I, I won't go into all the details of what was going on there, but the main victory here is that through many different email networks and all the different freedom groups out there spreading the word about this and demanding answers, it has caused an investigation by the state of Montana attorney general. And with all this pressure on, on them, the American Police Force Company has canceled the contract and is backing out now. So we've really stopped this very suspicious-looking thing from happening. 
there is definitely some very questionable things happening behind it. But now it's it's over. That that uh, contract is no longer being pursued. So that that's a victory, just simply by exposing it. And that and that really goes back to what the founder of the John Birch Society, Robert Welch, has always said that any conspiratorial plans, those who are trying to seek to do evil, cannot withstand exposure. The way to defeat a conspiracy is you expose it. And just to, to go back to the, the word conspiracy, it ought to be defined, because usually we don't define it, we just shun the whole word. A conspiracy is really nothing more than two or more people working in secret towards an evil end. And there's all kinds of conspiracies all throughout the world that we can talk about, whether it's the mafia or Bernie Madoff or, or whoever. But this grand conspiracy, the media, will shun to no end. They will never talk about it, and anyone who does must be crazy to talk about it. The thing that I admire about the John Birch Society is that they talk about conspiracies. They never talk about speculative conspiracies. I've never seen them publish anything that I would consider a conspiracy theory. Everything that we publish and talk about is well-established fact of conspiratorial plans. Well, and let me ask you, what do you know about groups like the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bilderberg Group? In particular, I mean, you've talked about the others earlier, but sure. what about the Bilderberg Group? The Bilderberg Group is, again, established by the same people. Um, the, the main purpose of that, it's, it's not one where there's a membership in it or anything like that, but it's a really kind of a convention of various delegates from countries around the world, whether they're prominent um, economic leaders in their country or governmental leaders, and it's a very secretive meeting, but one one in which, as much as we know of it, they never publish or talk about anything that goes on in the meeting. But we do know what the objective of those who go to it are. That these are all the people that are active globalists, those who are working for a merger of nations. And so, though there's a lot that is secret about that organization, we do know what the ultimate objectives are. And really going back to the Trilateral Commission as well, that, that was an organization also established for the purpose of merging merging nations, bringing nations to little by little, incrementally, piecemeal, establishing more integration. The uh, UN as well is a, really a great manifestation of that effort to continually create more and more governing power over the member nations. And so really all of these are just different branches of the same objective, the same organization that is striving for globalism. It's just many different departments, different chapters of the same organization. Well, let me ask you this, though. I mean, uh, we're looking now at down the gun, down the barrel, um, of what may be constituting a... Um, system or a form of government that would take away our freedoms like right now we have the freedom to do internet talk shows as well as online and have them broadcasted out there and have the freedom of speech that we hold so dear but we're about to lose that if we don't take a stand and change what it is that they're trying to do us as individuals we we can do it but will we? And I want you, before you go into that, Robert, uh, we're about to go in, into break time. I don't want you to get into that right now. I want you to focus on the last hour of the show on solutions. Okay. How can we, how can we change what, all, all the bad stuff that's already happened? How can we correct what our country is currently doing right now in the face of a globalist agenda for a totalitarian government. And would you mind uh, spending the whole hour? I'll even let you talk throughout the whole hour, if you can, okay. explaining how we can change that and how we can go back to 
the once great republic that we once were and can be again. Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. That That is really what brought me to the John Birch Society in the first place. I was looking for solutions. I understood the problem, and I was tired of talking about the problem. I wanted to talk about some solutions. What can we do to reverse this? And when I found the John Birch Society, it was the first time I found an organization on a nationwide level, well-organized, well, very well-experienced as well, in what works and what doesn't, with very clear plans of how to bring our nation back to liberty again. So we'll go into that again after the, the break. How much time do we have between now and the break? Okay, well, let me go ahead and uh, find out from, from my... Uh engineer here, a uh, wonderful guy by the name of Joe. Uh, could you give me an update on how much time we have until the break, Joe? Could you... Uh, we have only like three to five minutes, so I mean, it's going to take a lot longer uh, <laughs> for us to be able to, um, you know, talk about this than what we have until the break. <laughs> come, so uh, what I'd rather do is wait for the break to get here, and then uh, go ahead and go into it full force. So we have about eight minutes. Well, let me ask you this, though, on, a, uh, on another subject. You've heard about forced vaccinations. I am one of the individuals, or I am the individual, who on my, way, on my website was able to confirm a document that was being... Um, being sent over a cdc.gov website, a uh, secured web page, that confirmed that the state of Florida is doing forced, will do forced inoculations, and or if you choose not to do that, then it will be mandatory confinement and quarantine, which goes against our constitutionally protected rights. That's correct. And let me, uh, and let me ask you about that real quickly. Uh, right now. Have you heard about that? I mean, I have the document, but have you heard about that? And what is the Birch, John Birch Society doing to counter it? Well, first of all, yes, I have heard of that. And it's not just Florida. I've also seen legislation working through its, its way through in, Mon in, uh, excuse me, in Massachusetts. And I think also the one, most recent one I saw today was Pennsylvania. I could be wrong on that one. But uh, there's at least three or four other states out there who are one way or another working on mandating the vaccinations, which is a violation of our rights to really govern our own body. And so one of the main things that John Birch Society does in that on national level is educating, educating the people on the dangers of the swine flu versus the dangers of the vaccines and so on, and helping people have real, a really balanced um, reporting on what what they need to know to consider whether or not they want to choose the vaccine for themselves. Everyone should be able to choose yes or no on that. But when it comes to forced vaccinations, that's really being done on a state-by-state -state level at this point. And so we organize on the state level. We have teams of people in every state and virtually every community across the country. And and that is where it really needs to be fought, is at the state level with the state legislators hearing from their own constituents throughout the state. That is really the, the main power we have to withstand that. If ever it becomes a national issue where the federal government's trying to enforce that, at that point you really need your state government to stand up to the federal government. And we'll go into that a bit more in detail in the, in the next hour. But because that's really the main thing that we need to focus on is what we can do on the local and state level to withstand not only forced vaccinations, but any form of tyranny coming from the federal government. And real quickly, I want to answer one of the um, questions in the uh, chat room myself. Uh, Time for God and stated, in respect to two what these uh, two are discussing, wouldn't the ideal nation have all the elements of the ISMs in their structure? I wonder what Paul would do to create the ideal society. Number one, base it on, liber on liberty. 
Number one, base it on personal freedoms and choices, as we currently have now. Have a capitalistic structure that can sustain the country even through hard times. No overspending money if we don't have it. No printing money that we don't have out of thin air. And number two, working on personal responsibility of the individual other than as the group or within the group structure. In other words, have the individuals focus on uh, empowering their own lives and selves so they can be a constructive um, part of our society. That is part of it, but we'll go into even more after the break. And I do believe it's time for the break. And everybody, we will uh, be back after the break. This is Paul Price with the Prophecy Chronicles on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. Welcome to the Prophecy Chronicles with your host, Paul Richard Price. John McCain as a big government conservative. And really, they're, either one of those is... John, uh, by the way, could I, could I get you um, uh, to repeat that again, that question again? We had a, sure. a problem there for a second. Could you go ahead and uh, repeat that question you asked me, if you would, please? Certainly. The, the question was, are, are you a big government liberal, or are you a big government conservative? Well, what am I? I'm a uh, libertarian and a constitutionalist who believes in our republic and not in a democracy. Go ahead, right. please. And, and see, unfortunately, the, uh, the ballot box generally doesn't give a choice to someone who's neither big government liberal nor big government conservative. We have, for example, in the last presidential election, you have big government liberal Barack Obama running against a big government conservative John McCain. And it really doesn't matter which one of them you vote for, you're going to get bigger government. And that's really where, the, where some of the roots of the problem lie on the local and state level and even on the national level for the voting populace. You go to the ballot box, then you don't have a real choice. We don't have uh, you don't have a choice that's that's going to represent the founding fathers, the original intent of the Constitution. In most cases, uh, sometimes there's a third party candidate or something that uh, gets very little press or is maligned by the press. But in general, we don't have much of a much of a real choice. Some of the other problems that uh, we see is that those that are elected to U.S. Congress, as well as to the presidency, well, they all they all swear an oath to the U.S. Constitution, and then they don't think about the Constitution again until the next time they have to swear their oath. One of the things that the John Birch Society does to help us understand, first of all, where we are, is twice a year we publish in our magazine, the New American Magazine, we publish a report called the Freedom Index. Now, the Freedom Index, frankly, is the voting records of Congress compared to the Constitution. What they do is they choose the ten most constitutionally controversial votes from the House and then ten also from the Senate. Those issues where you vote one way, you've clearly violated the Constitution. You vote the other way, you've clearly followed it. There's always at least ten of those. There's quite a few more. But the top for Clunkers bill was one of them we just highlighted recently. Or the TARP bailout funds for uh, bailing out the economic institutions. Clearly, 
unconstitutional to vote for those things. And so what we do is we, cho- we go through every single member of Congress, every 435 members of the House, the 100 senators, and rate them on 10 different things they voted for in the last six months on how constitutional their voting was, give them a percentage score and everything. Now here in Montana, which is really my, my area where I'm working, we have one member of the House, that being Denny Reberg, and then we have two senators, just like every other state, uh, Senator Baucus and Senator Tester. And uh, one of the things I'm constantly doing is giving out their voting records, helping the citizens of the state of Montana to know how their elected officials have been voting. Because, again, as you expose it, people start to hold them accountable to it. Now, the average in the House this last last session, basically January through the end of June, they averaged 37% constitutional in the House. And in the Senate, it was 34%, which is pathetic, actually. But uh, there, there was one thing that was encouraging in there. Typically, there's one member of the House and no members of the Senate that get 100%. Uh, as I've watched this through the years, always Ron Paul of Texas always gets 100%, because every time he goes to vote, he asks himself, where in the Constitution do I have the authority? Can I pinpoint where I got the authority to support this bill? And whether he likes the bill or not, if he can't find the authority, he votes no. And this time, in our most recent publication, there were actually four members of Congress. Again, that's a small number compared to 535. But it's a big improvement. You had John Duncan of Tennessee and Jeff Flake of Arizona, along with Ron Paul of Texas, who all voted 100% constitutional in the House. Over in the Senate, you had Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, who's the only member of the Senate to earn a perfect score. So... One of, one of the many different things we do is we help expose those that are not following the Constitution and those that are following the Constitution so we can enable the citizens to hold them accountable to it. That's really one of the biggest problems we have is that our form of government works great as long as we follow it. And that's, that's where our biggest problems in this nation are coming from. If you look at the economic crisis, doing the things that both President Bush and President Obama have proposed to try to boost us out of this economic depression are just the opposite of what we should be doing. I'd like to use the example of Japan for a moment. Japan, 17 years ago, went from a real economic boom to a total crash of their economy. And over the last 17 years, they have done economic bailouts of financial institutions and of various businesses that were too big to fail. They've even taken over a number of businesses. They've lowered the interest rate and printed a bunch more, flooded the market with a bunch more paper money. They've done uh, government-sponsored work programs. Everything that the Obama administration and the Bush administration have done in response to our current economic recession, Japan has done and has continued to do over the last 17 years and they're still in their recession. It's clearly a a plan that doesn't work. It's it's a plan that has been tried in Great Britain to the point where even the Labor Party leader of Great Britain had to admit that this all it ever does for us is creates more inflation and more unemployment. And yet the question I often ask is, do do you suppose that Timothy Geithner and, and others that are part of Obama's economic team are unaware that what they're doing has never worked previously? Or do you think that they're doing it intentionally? And that's that's really one of the questions we we need to address, is that yeah, they they know what they're doing. If I know what works and what doesn't historically, they know it too. And they know what they're doing to supposedly rescue our economy is exactly what furthers the economic depression. So really the... uh, Going towards solutions now, one of the first things we need to do is educate the people. I can use a, uh, a quote here. Let's see here. James Madison really summed it up where he said, A well-instructed people alone 
can be permanently a free people. I find that as I travel around not only the state of Montana, but around the nation, very few people that I run across have ever actually read the U.S. Constitution and have much idea, much of an idea of what's actually in it. If we don't understand the Constitution, if we're not familiar with it, how can we recognize when something that our elected officials are doing is unconstitutional? I advocate to everyone I speak to, you, you have to read the Constitution, start becoming familiar with it. Organize a study group with some of your friends or neighbors and begin to learn the Constitution because and, and I, this is really the first step I did a number of years ago. As I started to learn the Constitution, I began to see that what we're doing today is miles away from the limited government that the Constitution prescribes. That's where I first began to understand the problem. Um, another great quote coming from Thomas Jefferson he says that uh, the power, uh, paraphrasing first of all here, that the power of liberty needs to be safeguarded within the people themselves. And then quoting it, he says, and if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with wholesome discretion. You know, pause there for a moment. So if the people, if the general public are not enlightened, they're not educated enough to protect liberty, which is exactly where we are today, he then goes on, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. And that's really where our solutions must begin. We need to educate the public on the principles of the Constitution, on the principles of liberty, and on how our elected officials are doing, whether they're upholding that or not. We need to educate the citizens of, the, of this nation on the threats to liberty. So what we covered in the first hour of this program, the, uh, those who maybe innocently are working for socialism and those who are intentionally using it as a tool to create power for themselves, whether they're on you know, either side of that that spectrum, those that are innocently advancing it and those that are intentionally working to destroy our nation. That, that needs to be exposed. The citizens of this nation need to understand liberty, they need to understand the Constitution, they need to understand the threat to it. And that's really where all of our solutions are based. From the, and this is what really brought me to the John Birch Society in the first place, was I was seeking a good source of irrefutable information on a regular basis, and, and I've never found an organization that does a better job than the John Birch Society in their educational tools. The first one I was ever exposed to was that Freedom Index I was just describing a few minutes ago, which gives the voting records of Congress compared to the Constitution. My own, in Montana here, my own um, U.S. Congressman, Denny Reberg, this last session, he, he got a... 60% rating, 60% uh, constitutional. Now, I'd pointed out that the average in the House is about 37, 38%. So 60 is quite a bit above average. However, I, I like to point out that he did make an oath. He swore an oath to uphold the Constitution, not partially, not when it's convenient, but 100% of the time. And so he's violating that oath 40% of the time. Now, I, I can't help but wonder, those of us that are, are married, if we kept our oath to our spouse 60% of the time, how many of us would be able to remain married? If we're cheating on our, on our wife, on our husband, 40% of the time, I think we'd be in big trouble. And, and that's actually part of the problems we're seeing in our nation today. And frankly bringing it back to the uh, the oath of office that every elected official swears, we need to not allow them to cheat on us in that way. We need to not allow them to follow the Constitution when it suits them. They need to be following it 100%, or they need to be having their feet held to the fire. These are some of the tools the John Birch Society puts out to help the people know what their voting record is, know how they compare to the Constitution so that we can hold their feet to the fire. Throughout, 
throughout the history of the John Birch Society in the 50 years we've been around, we've been publishing this information, and when it's used, it works really very well. I've seen it many times where there's U.S. congressmen holding a town hall meeting, and we often show up a little bit early and distribute copies of his voting record. And it really affects the, uh, the mood <laughs> of the meeting. You start getting people asking him about his oath of office. You have people asking him about, where did you find the constitutional authority to support this TARP funding? The Constitution is something that gives specific enumerated powers. Can you show me which enumerated power you are exercising there? So that's one of the first things we need to do is start holding our elected officials accountable to this. Now, my, my main job as the Montana State Field Coordinator is to travel throughout the state and organize teams of people, chapters is what we call them, in every community, organizing several chapters in each community that meet on a regular basis, number one, to review the different issues facing the nation at the time, but number two, and this is the most important thing, is to give specific assignments of action to be working on over the next few weeks. One of the main action things we do is educate the community. We need to spread the word. We need to help people understand the principles of liberty. When people understand the principles of liberty, it changes them. I've seen time and time again where people who really are very sold on the whole socialist mindset, as they begin to understand the principles of liberty, they begin to see through socialism, communism, or, or anything of that nature. I, in fact, recently there was a gentleman in northern Idaho who was a member of the Communist Party USA. He was an atheist, he was a communist, and as he began to learn principles of liberty, as well as learning about, uh, about religion, he became a Christian and he became a constitutionalist and a member of the John Birch Society. But I don't see, things, I don't see people go the other direction. Once people understand liberty, the lies of socialism don't have much sway with them. So really we focus, number one, on educating the people. I'm going to go through a little bit more of some of the details of what the John Birch Society publishes and puts out for the educational side of things. Uh, again, their magazine, the New American Magazine, which we currently publish every two weeks, is a pretty, pretty regular publication that way. And I've never seen its equal. Uh, I've mentioned earlier that the John Birch Society, I've never seen them publish anything about conspiracy theory, except in, in times where maybe they're debunking such a thing. But they do publish many things exposing conspiracy facts. Anything that can be well-documented, easily proven in a court of law, they'll go into in great detail. There are many other media sources out there that go to one or the other extreme ends of the spectrum. On the one end, we have the mainstream media that doesn't dare talk about anything at all controversial. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are publications out there that will talk about every passing conspiracy rumor. And we really need to find the proper balance where they are willing to go into what the real threats to liberty are. They're willing to talk about that which is controversial without straying off into the things which are speculative important to find a, a good balance there, and that's what, what really brought me to the John Birch Society is, again, their publications, how solid it was, how irrefutable it was. We, we don't need to give the mainstream media any ammunition to use against us. They will call us everything under the sun without that, but if we ever publish things that are totally speculative, they're going, going to seize to that and, and try, to, try to malign us any way they can. The uh, other things that we produce, a uh, number of different books. One of the best books I've ever seen on understanding the Council on Foreign Relations is a book by the, by the name of Shadows of Power uh, by a man named James Perloff. It has a subtitle, The Council on Foreign Relations and the American Decline. And it goes through and shows the power of the Council on Foreign Relations, the great amount of influence it has within the Congress, but especially within the White House and the media of this nation. Um, also, to understand the history of the um, 
Federal Reserve and the power behind it, which is just a fabulous documentary on that, is a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. I'm sure many of you have heard of that book before. The Creature from Jekyll Island really exposes, number one, the Federal Reserve is not federal. And frankly, it's not a reserve either. And so many other many other publications that we have available as well, several different DVDs that we produce. They're all very affordable. Most of the DVDs we produce cost as little as 2 or $3. In volume, you can get them for a dollar or less. Um, like the overview of America I was describing in the first hour, an excellent explanation of our form of government and what why we are a republic, not a democracy, and what the difference is. John McManus, the president of the Birch Society, has also produced a both a booklet and a DVD called Dollars and Cents, which is a, another great explanation of our monetary system, the history of the Federal Reserve, and some of the intents of why they wanted to go towards a Federal Reserve system, a paper money system, and some of the dangers of it. All of this in the category of educating the people, helping us understand liberty, understanding the threats to it. Uh, many different things we put out that way. We have several new booklets, one called Restoring the Rights of the States and the People. And that's some of what we want to go into more through the uh, last half of this hour, is how we can restore the rights of the states and the people. What I want to lay out here is a very simple plan for how to do that. Um, and this, this is a plan that was envisioned by Robert Welch, the founder of the John Birch Society, over 40 years ago. He envisioned that someday as federal government continues to usurp power and as the John Birch Society continues to grow, we'd eventually be in a position where we are now. This year, the John Birch Society just launched this plan, and that is to, state by state, starting with the smallest states, like Montana, which is why I'm, I'm working here, the smaller states that have one congressional district, one U.S. congressman, and focus our energies on teaching these principles of liberty to the citizens of that state. The amount of time and money and energy required to educate a small state is obviously far less than it requires to do in a large state like New York or Massachusetts. And yet, the power of the state is phenomenal. We have to understand, going back to the formation of the U.S. Constitution, that the U.S. Constitution is what established our federal government. And it was established by the states. The states are its creator. And uh, looking at some uh, maybe borrowing a phrase from the uh, from the Bible that we really have a situation where the creature has exceeded its master. That uh, the federal government originally under the Constitution had very little power. To quote James Madison from Federalist 45, he states in there that power extended to the federal government under the U.S. Constitution are few and defined. The powers extended to the states are many and indefinite. That's really where the government was originally under the Constitution. The federal government had very little power. The states were incredibly powerful. And they really still are if our governors and our state legislators choose to use that power. We're beginning to see some of the states around this country start to use some of that power. We've seen a number of Tenth Amendment resolutions, as they're called, being proposed in the last year. A Tenth Amendment re resolution, for those who haven't heard of it, very simply, is a statement from a state legislature to the federal government declaring the federal government has no authority in this area granted to them in the Constitution, therefore, the Tenth Amendment applies. The Tenth Amendment very simply says, let me turn to it so I can read it precisely, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or the people. Literally, that means that any powers not enumerated, not specifically given to the federal government in the Constitution, those powers are the powers of the states. 
any time the federal government usurps power, well, it belongs to the states or the people, if the state doesn't have it as well. So any time the federal government usurps power, they have to be taking it from someone. Typically, they're taking the power from the state in order for the federal government to have more power. So you have a Tenth Amendment resolution declaring, no, the federal government has no authority in this regard. Therefore, the state of Montana or the state of whatever will not be recognizing the federal government's authority in this area. A great example of this is Utah, where a number of years ago, when the No Child Left Behind Act had passed, the Utah state legislature voted on a resolution, really a Tenth Amendment resolution, declaring the federal government has no authority granted in the Constitution over our school system. There is no authority in the Constitution for a federal department of education. So the, the state of Utah declared we will not be enforcing the No Child Left Behind Act. There's no authority for it. And I thought, you know, great for them, good, good for Utah, making a stand against this federal tyranny. It only took 48 hours for the federal government to send agents to Salt Lake City. Those agents began visiting every department of Utah's state government that received any federal funding. I think you can all tell where this is going. They threatened those various departments that they would, re they would cut off their federal funding if the Utah legislature did not back down on this No Child Left Behind Act. So very quickly, Utah State Legislature backed down, and they are enforcing the No Child Left Behind Act in Utah. Now, the reason that happened, a lot of people say, well, why didn't they stand their guns? Why didn't they stand their ground and stand up for their rights? Unfortunately, the, the Utah State Legislature was not in the position to do so for two reasons. Number one, they didn't have the backing of the citizens of the state of Utah. I want you to just imagine for a moment the chaos that would happen throughout all the state of Utah when suddenly my favorite federally funded government program has lost its funding. And I don't really understand why. All I know is the, the state legislature somehow offended the federal government and they just defunded my favorite program. And so there would be an uproar throughout all the state of Utah over all these different programs no longer having their funding. The people of Utah, the citizens of Utah, were not educated on the principles of liberty and prepared to make that stand with their legislators. But that's half of the problem. The other half was there were not other states standing with Utah against the federal government on this issue. So those two elements are what need to happen in any state in order to use the power of the state to stand up against federal tyranny. Number one, we have to start with a grassroots effort to educate the citizens all across the state of whatever state we're targeting. In my case, the state of Montana. Educate the people community by community so that that community begins to understand the principles of liberty and they begin to demand liberty to be preserved by their elected officials. As you spread that from community to community across the state, it changes not only the community leaders, but it starts changing their state legislators one community at a time until you have a whole state legislature that feels the pressure that they need to support the Constitution, they need to support principles of liberty, and they need to withstand federal government encroachment on their power. You even change your governor. Your governor begins to support liberty. And yes, you do, you do actually start to affect your U.S. congressmen and your senators, which, which does help. In fact, uh, John McManus, a month or two ago, was on a radio or a TV show, uh, an interview with uh, Judge Napolitano on his cable TV show. And uh, he was talking about how to take back liberty through U.S. Congress. You target the House, because the House holds the purse strings. The House is where all revenue bills must start. Anything that requires federal funding 
has to first start out in the U.S. House of Representatives. And he says if you stop the funding at the House level, it, there's nothing the Senate or the President can do, or the U.S. Times, or excuse me, the New York Times, or or any other media cartel. That if you stop the funding, you stop the program. The response from the other guest on the show was, "Well, that majority margin in." in the House of 218 is a pretty steep hill to climb. John McManus' response was, well, no, I, I don't think we need to get 218. You just need to have a strong, vocal minority. If we have a dozen more members of the House of Representatives that were getting 100% constitutional ratings, boldly standing up for the Constitution, you change the political wind. And the fence-sitters began to see this change and began to follow the direction the wind is changing. They began to follow upholding the Constitution. So really, it, it happens on several different levels. This gives us a two-pronged, two-pronged attack. But not only do we affect our U.S. senators and our U.S. congressmen to start changing what's happening in Washington, D.C., but if you have several states who have state legislators, you have state governors who are willing to stand up for liberty despite what Washington, D.C. is doing. When you have several states willing to make that stand together, then the federal government has a serious problem that uh, they have to choose their battles carefully and, and typically they're going to have to back down on, on these various issues. That is really the solution to federal encroachments on, on our liberty. It really comes down to the power that the people have through the uh, power of their state government, through their congressmen, through their legislators, through their governor. A lot of people feel like their vote isn't worth very much, but on the local level, we, we can make a huge difference. And I've seen that on many different occasions, on many different issues. On the local and state level, a few people can make a huge difference. So that, that really brings, brings the, uh, the answer before you here, the uh, the way to restore liberty, kind of as a simple recap, is we have to educate our friends, our family, our neighbors on the principles of liberty. And, and I've found the, the best tools I can find for that through the John Birch Society, which can be purchased on our, our website, jbs.org. There's a little button up at the top right-hand corner that says shop, where you can find everything I've described tonight. Um, but as we share these things with our community, we educate our friends, our family on the principles of liberty. We start... We start uh, study groups studying the Constitution. We start holding our elected officials accountable as they start feeling that pressure. And we're seeing this work. Um, as they start feeling that pressure, that is when we either elect the right people or we change the people that are in office. And this, is, this is really how Ron Paul continues to get elected in, in Texas. That... Uh, we continue to actively teach the principles of liberty in his district, publishing his voting record. The people in his district understand the principles of liberty. This is what he said as to how he continues to get reelected by educating the people in his district. And he, he mentions the efforts of the John Birch Society as being very key to that. That uh, when they understand the principles of liberty, they won't accept anything less, despite what his own party has done to try to keep him out of office. People like Newt Gingrich have raised millions of dollars to try to defeat Ron Paul because clearly Ron Paul stands for the Constitution and Newt Gingrich, among others, stand for globalism. But they don't like that, that uh, type of competition. <laughs> and so this can be done. It's been done in Texas. It's been being done right now in places like Oklahoma. Um... We're seeing great success with this same objective in the state of Montana right now. The, and really, there's never been a better time to enact this. We've seen in the last year the start of many new freedom-loving organizations. We have the Tea Party organization. You have the Campaign for Liberty through Ron Paul. You have the Glenn Beck's group, the 912 Project. You have, uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Many new freedom-loving organizations popping up all over the place because people are tired of what they're seeing, massive amounts of federal encroachment, and they're looking for answers. They're looking for solutions. 
in the 50 years the John Birch Society has been around, we've seen thousands of these kinds of organizations come and go. Many of them become infiltrated. Some of them are thrown off, off track from the top. My suggestion to people is educate yourselves on the principles of liberty and the threats to it and help these organizations stay on track. One of the best things I do, I feel, for these organizations is plug them into things like the New American Magazine, where you won't be thrown off track with varying views. Um, we've seen many organizations start uh, supporting dangerous objectives. One of those would be the call for a constitutional convention. Uh, there are those within the Tea Party organization and others who are pushing for that, that we need to propose a new constitutional convention to force the federal government to pass certain amendments to the U.S. Constitution, like a balanced budget amendment. Now, don't get me wrong, I support a balanced budget amendment, but to try to achieve a balanced budget amendment by calling for a constitutional convention is an extremely dangerous method. So we always want to warn people about the dangers. I'll just touch on that one briefly. That if a constitutional convention is called, you have to understand that they have the power to completely propose a total change of our form of government. That's, that's what has happened historically. There's only been one other constitutional convention nationally in the history of our nation. That was in 1787, out of which we, get, we received our U.S. Constitution. They totally threw out the previous form of government, changed the rules of ratification for it. It was supposed to be all 13 states unanimously ratifying it. They changed that rule and said it's going to be nine states. And if we were to convene a constitutional convention again today, they again can do that. They can throw away our current form of government and propose a new one. The only thing that will determine what form of government comes out of that constitutional convention is the moral character of the delegates to the convention. So I ask, who chooses the delegates? Whoever chooses delegates, whoever's in charge of the selection of the delegates for the various states, chooses the outcome of that constitutional convention. The scary answer to that is Congress is in charge of the selection of delegates process. If I could trust Congress to choose good, moral, freedom-loving people to be the delegates to that convention, well, then we probably wouldn't be having the problem with Congress we have right now, would we? <laughs> so, one of the most important things, going back to where I was starting from here, all the various freedom-loving organizations across the country that are starting up, we need to pull together. We need to educate each other. We need to warn each other about the dangers of being thrown off track or being infiltrated. Working together to educate on the principles of liberty. I really the best thing I can recommend as far as keeping people on track, not being thrown off onto different uh, objectives like this Constitutional Convention or other things, is to be informed yourself. The best thing you can do on that, in my mind, is to regularly read The New American. You can pull up many of the articles from The New American on thenewamerican.com, their website, as well as subscribing to it there online. Becoming a member of the John Birch Society gets you the New American Magazine subscription, but it also gives you one other thing, and that is a monthly publication called the John Birch Society Bulletin. What the bulletin is, is specific action plans on a month-by-month -month basis, what all John Birch Society chapters in every community in every state across the nation are going to be attacking as our primary targets for the next 30 days. That's what the bulletin covers. And so being part of a nationwide focused attack on a month-by-month -month basis. That's really what being a member of the John Birch Society is about. But lastly, one other element that is desperately needed, it's not enough to teach about the principles of liberty and the Constitution and, and hold our elected officials accountable to that. And this lesson is really learned from the Founding Fathers again. Um, Benjamin Frank Franklin pointed out this way, that only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. We really can never truly be a self-governing people unless we're a moral and religious people. 
the words of John Adams as well, our Constitution was made only for moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And I could go on and on on different things the Founding Fathers have said on that issue. Um, the simplest way that, again, referring to John McManus, the president of the John Birch Society, he puts it that the government needs to be restrained by the Constitution, and the people of the country need to be self-restrained by the principles of the Ten Commandments. And with both of those together, understanding and defending the principles of liber liberty through the Constitution, and then with being a moral and religious people, that's the only way we, re we really can restore freedom in this nation. So that's kind of the, the long answer to your question of what we can do specifically. There's John Birch Society organizations in every community, in every state across this country. Uh, if you want to find out who they are, where they are, and, and start working with them, I recommend going to our main website, uh, jbs.org, where you can get more information on there, um, as, w as well as going on to our new, thenewamerican.com. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, thenewamerican.com website to learn more of what we're publishing on a monthly or on a every two weeks basis there. So, did I cover everything you're wanting me to cover there? Well, I've got a question, question by uh, with one of the um, uh, people in the chat room. Time forgotten. Can an American citizen approach a senator for help with a personal problem to do with some government service? You shouldn't be able to, but it depends, in my opinion, on what the senator thinks he or she thinks is important. Am I it, correct on that? Well, yes, there's really two questions here. Number one is if you can even get to your senator and get them to listen to you. <laughs> but the main question that needs to be asked first is do they have the authority to help with the problem you're having? As a U.S. Senator, their jurisdiction, their authority has to do with the federal government and legislation. Really the primary job of the U.S. Congress, Senators, Congressmen, and so on, is legislation. As uh, Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1, the very first line of the U.S. Con Constitution states, all legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Their, their duty, their job is specifically listed in Article I of the U.S. Constitution, especially Section A. That's where the majority of their powers are enumerated. And so if I'm having a problem with something on a local or state issue, no, my U.S. Senator is really probably not the, the best person to talk to about that. And you always want to start with the lowest level of government first. If they have the power to deal with it, great. If, if not, you might need to go up one level. Well, here's what I think we need to do. I mean, number one, we need, and this is what I think, and I have thought for a long time, and we have three minutes left to go on the show, and it's been great having you. As a guest Thank you. on the show, Robert. Thank God for you. And I want to bring this up. I think that we should have term limitations on both the House of Rep and the Senate. And that after they serve one term, as our founding fathers, including George Washington, stated, politicians should not make it a lifelong career to be politicians. You know, I, so, um, I think we finally found my, a point where we don't completely agree. <laughs> what again? I, I said I think we found a point upon which we don't completely agree. I personally, as well as the, the John Birch Society, does speak out against term limits, and the main reason why is that you're limiting good as well as the bad. You have people like Ron Paul that I mentioned earlier that follow the Constitution 100 percent of the time, and in exchange for that, you get people that are novices that really don't understand their job and, and don't understand the Constitution continually in office. In Montana, we do have term limits, and I, I see it as a bit of a problem in that the good ones don't get to stay in there long, nor do the bad ones. The, the real solution, I, I think, and this is the position of the John Birch Society on term limits, is that 
rather than term limits limiting how long someone's in office, the people need to be educated and not vote for those that shouldn't continue being in office. If we truly do our job of educating people on the voting records of, of some of these people that, uh, oh, like John Tester, our, our senator from Montana, who got a 0% constitutional rating this last time. As we expose that to the people of Montana, there needs to be a serious outcry against him. Term limits, unfortunately, get rid of the good ones as well as the bad ones, where an educated populace gets rid of the bad ones without getting rid of the good ones. So we, we've never been real supporter of term limits so much as educating getting rid of the bugs, of right? Right. Getting, getting rid, rid of, of the problems bad by seeds, getting them out of there. Right. Okay, so, um, and you've already mentioned the website, and let me tell my listeners, we have one minute left to go. Okay. Uh, my website, again, is paulrichardprice.com. Everyone, go and go to that site. You will hear the truth there, and what you do with it is up to you. And I want to thank you again, Robert. And again, tell us about your website. Again, uh, the John Birch Society's primary website is jbs.org, John Birch, John Birch Society. And then our other website for our magazine is thenewamerican.com. Both of those on a daily basis publish new articles on, on both websites, keep you very informed just keeping up with what's on, published on there. You can also do searches and different things. You can buy different materials we have available by going to the shop button on the jbs.org website. Uh, our DVDs, our magazines, our booklets, and many other books and things available on there. There's an online community on the jbs.org website, very much like a, a meetup type community where you can find different people in your neck of the woods that believe in principles of liberty, whether they're members of the Birch Society or not. Great way to communicate and network with people throughout the country as well as locally. Many different things on there. I won't go through every detail of the website, but fabulous resources. I'm really pleased with the uh, new websites we have public that they put out earlier this year. And well, again, I thank you for having me tonight. You're welcome, and I want to thank my listeners. And again, you can hear me uh, again. Uh, you can hear the uh, podcast on paulrichardprice.com. You, you guys come and support my website, and you will hear the truth there and here. What you do with it is up to you. This is Paul Richie Price signing off. Good day, and God bless you all. Good night.